In this lecture, we demonstrate a method of analysis for second-order circuits in which an inductor and capacitor are connected in parallel. We show how to obtain the initial conditions for the inductor current and its derivative, and then demonstrate how to use those conditions to solve for the inductor current in underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped circuits. Well, here's a circuit with an inductor and capacitor connected in parallel with each other and in parallel with two series combinations of voltage sources and resistors. Before time t equals zero, only the 10 volt source and its resistor are in the circuit, but after time t equals zero, when we close this switch, both the 10 volt and the 20 volt sources along with the resistors will be connected to this circuit. Now at the instant just before the switch is changed, only the 10 volt source and its resistor are in the circuit. And because the 10 volt source is a DC source, the inductor will behave like a short and the capacitor will behave like an open. So at the instant that the switch is closed, because the inductor current and the capacitor voltage have to be continuous and cannot change instantaneously, we'll see no voltage across the capacitor because of the short of the inductor and the inductor current will be the voltage 10 volts divided by the resistance R. Now when we connect the switch we'll add the 20 volt source along with its resistance into the circuit as we've shown here and because the inductor and capacitor are in parallel the voltage across these elements is equal and because the voltage across an inductor is equal to the inductance times the derivative of the current through the inductor, we have this following relationship between the derivative of the inductor current and the capacitor voltage. So the derivative of the inductor current is, for this particular connection of these elements, is the capacitor voltage divided by the inductance. This relationship then can be used to determine the initial condition for the derivative of the inductor current. So the derivative of the inductor current at time t equals zero is the voltage across the capacitor at t equals zero divided by the inductance. The voltage across the capacitor is zero, so this will be zero. Now after determining the initial conditions, we can use Kirchhoff's current law to write a differential equation for this circuit. To do this, we assign the bottom node as our reference or ground node and then note that the top node relative to the ground is the voltage, the capacitor voltage, Vc. Now the current flowing toward the 10 volt source is Vc minus 10 divided by this resistance R. The current flowing toward the 20 volt source is Vc minus 20 divided by the resistance R. Now the current flowing through the inductor, for now I'm going to just label that as the inductor current and the current flowing through the capacitor, I'll use the relationship between the current flowing through a capacitor and its voltage, and that current is the capacitance times the derivative of the voltage. And that's the four currents flowing out of that node. I'll sum that up and have that equal to zero. Now because it's relatively simple to develop the initial conditions for the inductor current and its derivative, and because the inductor voltage is equal to the capacitor voltage, we can use the following transformations to relate the capacitor voltage and the inductor current. So the voltage across the, the inductor, which is the voltage across the capacitor, is the inductance times the derivative of the current through the inductor. Therefore, the derivative of this voltage will be the inductance times the second derivative of the current. Well then we can use these relationships in our original differential equation to develop a differential equation in terms of the inductor current. So if we combine the two terms with the capacitor voltage, we'll have 2 over R times the capacitor voltage, but the capacitor voltage is the inductance times the derivative of the inductor current. So we'll have 2 over R times the inductance times the derivative of the current. The derivative of the capacitor voltage is the inductance times the second derivative of the inductor current, so the capacitor, capacitance times the derivative of its voltage will be the capacitance times the inductance times the second derivative of the inductor current, and then this inductor current will remain 
unchanged. And we'll combine these two terms. We'll have negative 30 over r, take them to the other side, and the constant driving function is 30 over r. Now because the driving function for this differential equation is 30 over r, and because the coefficient for the current is 1, we can at this time determine that the final value for the inductor current will be 30 divided by r divided by this coefficient which is 1, so it'll be just simply 30 divided by this resistance value r. Now to determine the manner in which the inductor current transforms, transitions from its initial value of 10 over r to its final value of 30 over r, we begin with the characteristic equation. Now recall that the coefficient in the characteristic equation for s squared is the coefficient for the second derivative. The coefficient for s is the coefficient for the first derivative and, and the constant coefficient is the coefficient for the function itself. So we'll have c, the capacitance, times the inductance, times s squared, plus twice the inductance over the resistance, uh, divided by the resistance, times s plus 1 is equal to 0. Now it's sometimes easier to work with this equation if we divide all of the coefficients by the coefficient that multiplies s squared. So in that case we'll have 2 over rc times s plus 1 over lc, and that'll still be equal to 0. From here we can use the quadratic formula to determine the two roots. And here's the general formula for the roots in terms of the resistance, the capacitance, and the inductance. Well now I'd like to take a look at a few examples with specific values for the resistance, the inductance, and the capacitance. And as a reminder we'll just uh, repost the expression for the roots of the characteristic equation that give us the transient values for this inductor current. Well let's begin with a situation where the resistors, both resistance have a value of 1 ohm, the capacitance has a value of 1 farad, and the inductance is 4 thirds Henry's. Well this will result in two roots. The first root is negative 1 half and the second root is negative 3 halves. Now this corresponds to the situation where the quantity inside the square root is positive, so we've, we refer to this as an overdamped situation with these two roots. The inductor current then is k1 times e to the negative one-half t, that's our first root, another constant k2 e to the negative three-halves t, plus the final value which is 30 divided by the resistance, and the resistance is 1, so that'll just be 30. To determine the unknown coefficients, k1 and k2, we'll need to look at an expression for the derivative of the inductor current. So the derivative of the inductor current would be negative 1 half k1 e to the negative 1 half t, and then minus 3 halves k2 e to the negative 3 half t, and the derivative of 30 would just be 0. Then we can use our initial conditions for the current and its derivative to obtain two equations in the two unknown constants k1 and k2. So when we substitute t equals 0 for the current we get k1 plus k2 plus 30 and that's equal to 10 over r but r is 1 so that's equal to 10. When we substitute t equals 0 in the derivative we'll get negative 1 half k1 minus 3 halves k2 and that through our initial condition must be equal to 0. So we can solve these two equations and determine that k1 is negative 30 and k2 is equal to 10. The expression for the inductor current then is negative 30 e to the negative 1 half t plus 10 e to the negative 3 halves t plus 30. Now because the inductor voltage and the capacitor voltage are the same, we can solve for the capacitor voltage by differentiating the inductor current and multiplying by the inductor's inductance. So if we differentiate this term, we'll obtain 15 e to the negative 1 half t minus 15 e to the negative 3 halves t plus 0, and then if we multiply that by 4 thirds, the inductance will have 20 e to the negative 1 half t minus 20 e to the negative 3 halves t. And that's the expression for the capacitor voltage. 
Knowing the capacitor voltage, we could solve for the voltage across either of these resistors or the current through either of those resistors. Well, now let's see what happens if we keep the resistance equal to 1 ohm, the capacitance equal to 1 farad, and drop the inductance down to 1 henry. In this case, the quantity inside the square root will be equal to 0, and we'll have repeated roots at s equal to negative 1. The inductor current, then, has the form k1 e to the negative t, that's the root, the first root, plus k2 times t e to the negative t. So this is the way we handle repeated roots by adding this factor of t, and then our final value is still 30. Now to solve for the unknown constants, as we did before, we'll have to find the derivative. That'll be negative k1 e to the negative t plus k2 e to the negative t minus k2 t e to the negative t. We can then use our initial conditions for the inductor current and the derivative of the inductor current. Substitute t equals 0, we'll have k1 plus 30 equal to 10. The resistance is still 1. And negative k1 plus k2, and again when t is equal to 0 this will be gone, so that's negative k1 plus k2, and the initial condition for the derivative is 0. Two equations, two unknowns. Solve for the constants k1 and k2, and they're both equal to negative 20. The inductor current, then, is negative 20 e to the negative t minus 20 times t e to the negative t plus the final value of 30. And again, if we want to solve for the capacitor voltage by the same logic, we'll take the derivative of the inductor current and multiply by the inductance, and that'll give us negative 1 times negative 20, that'll be 20 e to the negative t, and then minus 20 e to the negative t, and then plus 20 times t e to the negative t. We multiply by the inductance, but that has a value of 1 henry, so this is our solution for the capacitor voltage. Well, finally, let's decrease the capacitance, or the, decrease the inductance again. And in this situation, the quantity inside the square root would be negative. So our two roots will be complex valued. One of the roots will be negative 1 plus j times 2. The other root would be negative 1 minus j times 2. In that situation, the form for the inductor current is e to the negative 1 times t, that's the real valued part of the two roots, times k1 cosine, and the imaginary part of the roots becomes the frequency in radians per second. So cosine of 2t plus another constant times the sine of 2t, and then we add in the final value. Again, if we want to solve for the constants k1 and k2, we'll differentiate this current And then we'll use our initial conditions, just as we did in the other two situations, and come up with two equations for two unknowns. And that allows us to solve for k1 equal to negative 20 and k2 equal to negative 10. We can put those back into our original expression, and the expression for our current through the inductor would be 30 minus e to the negative t, 20 cosine 2t plus 10 sine 2t. And using the same logic we did in the other situations, we could solve for the capacitor voltage, and we'd get this expression. So this is a situation where the quantity inside the square root is negative. So we have complex valued roots. We refer to this as an underdamped situation. When the quantity inside the square root was 0, that was critically damped, and when it was positive, that was overdamped. So let me just conclude by showing a couple of graphs, plots, of the inductor current in these three situations. Well, here are three plots for the three situations we just looked at. These are plots of the inductor current as a function of time. The blue plot corresponds to the underdamped situation. Excuse me, blue plot corresponds to the overdamped situation, the green to the critically damped, and the red to the underdamped situation. So you can see when we're underdamped, we do get oscillation, although we get to the final value a little bit quicker. 
here's critically damped and then when we're over damped we have we don't have oscillation but it does take a little longer to get to the final value well for those same circuits here are three plots of the capacitor voltage as a function of time the blue again is the over damped situation the green is the critically damped and the red corresponds to the under damped 